Good morning, everybody. Again, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is post-op weight regain. Uh, all right, so no matter what procedures you guys do, sleeve, the bypass, or the duodenal switch, uh, because of the chronicity of the disease of obesity, there's going to be weight regain. So you can do the best staple job or whatever you guys do, under, over, everything can be perfect. But unfortunately, um, you know, because of the disease of obesity, we do see weight gain in all of these uh, procedures. Um, and that's why I think in the beginning you need to talk about realistic expectations and really talk about post-op weight regain before the surgery. Because remember, the most important thing for these patients is not that they're going to get a leak or a PE or anything. They're afraid that it's not going to work. They're not going to lose as much weight or they're going to gain back weight. And so when that happens, they're mortified and they don't want to come back. They're embarrassed. They think it's something that they did. So I think having that talk with them early on, because as I said yesterday, it's much easier to get them back on track with weight loss, continued weight loss, when they're just starting to gain weight rather than when they've gone all the way up and then restarting again. Then we're really behind the eight ball. Because remember, physiologically, I think weight maintenance is different from weight loss or weight from losing weight. And so I think from a pharmacotherapy standpoint, we have much better use of medications to try to have people maintain weight after surgical or intensive medical weight loss. So I talked about this Get the Goal Free app. So what we do with everybody is we put in their BMI, age, and uh, um, information prior to surgery, and it'll give them their expected weight loss after surgery. And so I think that's important to try to make sure you're on the same page with what surgery you're going to uh, do on that patient. It is a personalized weight loss goal that tracks weight over time. It calculates the um, um, percent excess body weight uh, at the 50, 25%, and 75%. And then after surgery, which I think is equally as important, is that they can monitor their weight. Um, and this was an individual that started to gain weight back soon after surgery or didn't match. We put her on some fentramine or some weight loss medications, and we treated her for depression. And actually, she's gotten down to almost 75% of excess body weight of prediction. So I think that this is one example that she was not going in the right direction and that we were able to intervene early. The surgery was fine. There was no problem in, a, anatomically. So I, I think that uh, a con continued accountability is really important. So weight gain following surgery is not uncommon. Uh, the gain uh, approximately 10% from the lowest nadir weight. It usually occurs about 8 to 12 months after surgery. Continued accountability and follow-up provides the best chance for early intervention, as we said. Mm -hmm. And you can really diagnose the problem by history and uh, uh, the weight loss graph. So I break this up into buckets. So the first thing that patients always want to know is, is the anastomosis, is everything intact? And I think that's really important. We commented about this on Thursday, I think. So you always want to define the anatomy. So you do an upper GI or CAT scan because if they don't feel as full or if they're gaining weight, they don't feel that sense of, sense of satiety that they have. So I think that that's really important to check for any problems with it. And if the GG fistula is there, it's not that common. But usually you can diagnose it by just the weight loss graph because you can sometimes have the return of symptoms of, ref of uh, gastroesophageal reflux because remember, if there's a co uh, connection between the um, neostomach or the pouch and the remnant, you're going to get acid reflux up there, so they start to get reflux. That's a really telltelling. And then the weight loss is not the gradual weight loss. It's more of an ex expedited weight loss gra uh, increase. And I think this is important, as we talked about. No matter if there's anything or not wrong anatomically, I think it's important to go back to you all have you look at the anastomosis or look at the anatomy, make sure everything is okay from your standpoint, and then send them back to us. Because that, I can say anything, I can say, oh, everything is good, we did an upper GI, but until you guys say, you know, there's really nothing more we can do or you need to work more intensively with medicine and nutrition, I think that is important. So then we deal with uh, dietary intake. I, I'm going to talk about dietary intake, um, exercise, depression, metabolism, and then uh, genetics and pharmacotherapy. Mm -hmm. 
So dietary indiscretion, I think, is the most common cause of weight gain following bariatric surgery. It usually occurs about 12 to 16 months after. And what happens if you look at dietary recalls, the patients change from the two to three regimented meals to more of a grazing type of pattern. And if you look at the macronutrient composition of these diets, they change from predominantly protein. Remember, we want 60% of each meal coming from protein followed by fruits, vegetables, and limited starches. But if you look at these individuals, they change to more of the carbohydrate base and they're more grazing and they're more soft calories and uh, predominant. And remember, the dumping syndrome is just the inability for our body to take simple sugars and carbohydrates initially. Just like any small bowel adaptation, over time, if you tax your small bowel, you're going to be able to take carbohydrates no problem at all. So when patients come in and say, oh, you know, I can't take any ice cream, I get a lot of diarrhea and cramping, you know, a year out or two years out, that is great. It's the people that, I, that worry me and say, you know, I can eat anything and nothing bothers me, doc. Those are the ones that, you know, are, that, that have a, uh, may have a, a problem. So I think that is really important to look at what their diet uh, intake is. And this is an old study, but I think it's really important to, 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 to tell the patients at least to have protein in the morning. Because uh, the goal is to have 60% uh, of each meal coming from protein. But protein in the morning has been shown for years and years and years, if you look at weight manage management, to be most effective. If you have protein in the morning, you're less, asked, less apt to eat calories after 4 o'clock in, in p.m. So this just says that Higher glycemic index meals are associated with postprandial intake uh, throughout the day. So I, I do think that that's um, important to talk to our patients about. The other thing is, and this is not so much uh, important for weight loss, but it is really important for weight maintenance, and that is exercise. And the reason being is that with rapid weight loss, especially with surgical weight loss, there's a significant decrease in muscle mass following... <laughs> And that decreases our resting energy expenditure and decrease in physical activity. So if we look, ooh, did I do that? No, I think I did that. Thanks. So if we look at this schematic here, uh, this is our total energy expenditure. And our lean body mass um, makes up about 70 to 80% of our total energy expenditure. There's a small amount of thermal effect of food, so when we eat a meal, there's about a 2 to 3% increase in our energy expenditure. And then what our activities of, daily, activities of daily living, this is what we can monitor. But what happens with, uh, with weight loss, we decrease our lean body mass, which significantly decreases our basal metabolic rate. So the only chance we have of significant weight maintenance is by maintaining our lean body mass through exercise. If we look at the literature, exercise really doesn't help that much with weight loss, but it's crucial for weight maintenance. If we don't exercise, we have a very hard time at maintaining any significant weight loss. Uh, next slide. The other thing is depression after bariatric surgery. This is really important, I believe, even if they did not necessarily have a depression history prior. As we know, as our body mass index goes up, so does the rate of non-suicidal depression. If you take a, a BMI cohort of 40, BMI of 40 or greater, it has two times the amount of depression than a normal BMI individual. So depression is common in patients with obesity, so we screen everybody for depression because basically what happens we self-medicate with food, and the food that we medicate is carbohydrates. That increases uh, serotonin. That gives us that calm and content feeling. It lasts about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we go into that grazing type of mode. So I think that you want to uh, often screen for depression, even if they didn't have depression postoperatively. We know that if you look early on, Beck depression and depression inventory scores significantly increase so to quality in life but after that year mark you really want to continue to monitor for uh, depression because it can uh, reoccur even if they didn't have um, uh, depression prior so grazing patterns increase that carbohydrate consumption you want to screen avoid any weight stimulating depression medications 
encourage uh, support group participation, and I'm going to talk about this at the end. This is not the support group that everybody goes to right after in the honeymoon phase. These are more smaller, more in-depth, um, uh, personalized support groups, usually run by the dietitian and the psychologist to help them get back on track. And then we'll break the grazing cycle with a uh, protein sparing modified fast or a liquid diet um, to try to get them uh, back on track with that. The other thing is with regards to medications, these are not weight loss medications, but these are medications that we all prescribe that can promote weight gain or retard weight loss. And it's estimated that the epidemic of obesity worldwide is 10% is attributed to atrogenic medications that we all prescribe. So now there's a whole host of, of alternative medications in, in all the disease states that can promote weight loss and not significantly can in, influence weight gain. I think the biggest gains we've had is in the anti-diabetic medications. You know, the sulfonylureas and the insulins that significantly promote weight gain. Now we have the GLP-1s, the SGLT-2s, metformins, that type of thing. So that's come a long way. And the antidepressants as well. The antidepressants, by and large, the SSRIs are all weight neutral. There is a medication called Paxil or Paroxetine that's a very good medication, but it can cause weight gain in about 22 to 25% of individuals. So you want to make sure you're not prescribing a medication that can promote weight gain. And then this is what I talked about yesterday when I was talking about post-op weight uh, or indications for revisions yesterday. There's a whole host of physiologic and metabolic um, adaptations that our body does irrespective of what we're doing with diet and exercise. They can be doing everything we're asking them to do and they still may not be losing as much weight as we had hoped or even gaining weight back. I touched on this um, on Thursday about uh, the genetics. So if you look at these, these are allele burdens. So the number of alleles, every gene has two alleles. So we looked at just five alleles or, ten, or ten, five genes and ten alleles and you can see if, if you have a BMI less than 50, the less allele burden you have, you have a good chance of losing weight and keeping it off after gastric bypass. But if you have a higher allele burden of five or more, or have a BMI greater than 50 with those rare variants, it's, they has a, a background of, of uh, genetics that really is, influences weight loss and weight regain. So I think with the BMI greater than 50, you really want to try to pick your surger, surgical intervention closely or carefully because your patients have a higher rate of weight and not losing as much weight with some of the procedures. The other thing is the, the, the um, hormonal um, um, effects of appetite. So this is a study looking at 10 weeks of weight loss. You can see there was a 14% weight loss but a 65% reduction in leptin. Remember, leptin is a stimulant that's produced by the fat cells that goes to the brain to increase appetite. And so you can see that despite whatever we do, our hormones are telling us to eat more. And even when we gain back a little bit of weight, or the weight loss is 9%, there's still a significant reduction of 35% of leptin. And then the other incretins also are low, which are, uh, promote weight gain. And ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone produced by the stomach, is significantly increased at all, all to increase weight back after surgery. There's change in microbiota, uh, microbiome that influences uh, absorption and influences GLP-1 receptors actually in the gut. There's also a change in intestinal permeability that can affect absorption of carbohydrates specifically after weight loss to promote weight regain. And then finally, there's changes in the um, taste receptors within the gut that may influence post-op re regain. All of those factors the patient has no control of. So this is my uh, suggested treatment plan. Consider an upper GI. I think this is really important to make sure that the, you, what you guys do is in intact because that's really the number one thing they want to know, patients. You know, is there something wrong with my surgery? Can something be redone surgically? If there's not, then we try to break the carbohydrate cycle with a two-week liquid diet or a protein sparing modified fast and add back then fruits, vegetables, and limited starches. You want to screen for depression, very, very important. This will really help your patients and you help with post-operative weight regain. Review any medications um, to make sure that they're not promoting weight regain. Water intake. 
So when we reduce our calories, our body conserves its fat stores. So by drinking water, it replenishes our blood volume and it maintains the rate of lipolysis or fat breakdown. So if you take two groups of individuals, one that groups that drink 64 ounces of water and one group that does not, whether it's medical or surgical weight loss patients, the patients that drink the water are going to lose more weight because it maintains that rate of lipolysis. When we reduce calories, our body sees it as more of a starvation state and it will conserve fat stores. So it sort of tricks our liver, if you will. Weekly weigh-ins or that accountability I think is important. And then encourage getting back on track support groups, not the regular big support groups. These are much more smaller, intensive with uh, nutrition and psychiatry or psychologists. And then finally, consider weight loss medications. I think that there's a huge area of adjuvant therapy after surgery with pharmacotherapy. Um, the, all of the patients are indicated as BMI of 27 or more or 30 alone. Any bariatric surgery patient is indicated for surgery or for pharmacotherapy. So I would be uh, familiar with these. Uh, Phentermine is the number one prescribed medication in the country. Orlistat is the only non-systemically acting medication. It's a, it's a tetrahydrolipostatin. It blocks 30% of all ingested fat that we take in. Phentermine and topiramate is Qsimia in the United States. Lecarserin is a serotonergic medication called Belvique. Propropione and naltrexone is Contrave. And loraglutide at 3 milligrams is Sixenda. I just will briefly go through phentermine and a couple that are, are, that are available here. So this is the most commonly prescribed medication in the country today by 90%. In the States, it's very cheap. It's generic and it's the number one prescribed uh, uh, medication that it says. It has 8 milligrams, 15, 30, and 37.5. The medication lasts about 8 to 10 hours. And this is the medication that I always will start with because it's just a mild appetite suppressant medication that's usually well tolerated. I usually have patients take it around 10 or 11 in the morning. If they take it too late in the day, they're not going to sleep as well at night. If they take it too early, they may be hungry in the morning. So this is something that uh, I think that um, is, is a, a good go-to medication. Lecarserin is a serotonergic medication. If you remember back in the days of Fenfen, Fentermine is still available. I just talked about but Fenfluramine and its cousin Dexfenfluramine, a redox was taken off the market in 1999 because of primary pulmonary hypertension and valvulopathy. This is a 2C, serotonin 2C. 2B was fenfluramine and dexfenfluramine. That was B for bad because it affected the pulmonary vasculature. C is very selective to appetite. It's not the most effective medication if you look at efficacy, but it's very, very safe. It's a once a day medication as well. Phentermine and topiramate. So phentermine, the biggest problem with phentermine, you can get a tolerance to it. So you either have to increase the dose or give a drug holiday for six or eight weeks. But you can also add a little bit of topiramate, just 25 milligrams. So this is Qsimia. If you look at the efficacy of all the weight loss medications, this is the most effective. This and loraglutide. Um, but this um, is, helps um, as well. The big thing about the topiramate is the fetal toxicity, so you have to make sure your patients, the women, ha are on child uh, protection or, or uh, on uh, um, birth control. Propropion and naltrexone, so albutrin's been around a long time as in naltrexone. These two in combination have been shown to be very effective. This in loraglutide helps with craving and satiety. Remember, a lot of times we don't eat because we're hungry. We don't eat because we're not satiated. So we go pick. So this and loraglutide, I think, is very helpful for that. And just a little bit of naltrexone. The big thing about naltrexone, or the biggest problem with this medication, if they're on opioids, they're not going to be your friend because the opioids are not going to work. And so that is really important. Um, if they're on chronic opioid medications for chronic pain, you don't want to use this medication. And then finally, loraglutide, 3 milligrams in the state, it's approved for weight loss. It's 1.8 is approved for diabetes. Um, but this is also a very good medication, in my opinion, because it helps uh, peripherally, but also centrally in the uh, Palm C to help with appetite and satiety. So those are the medications that are approved, at least in the states. I think that any practice, no matter what, how... Uh, if you follow your patients long enough, you're going to have an issue with post-op weight regain. And I think if there's nothing wrong anatomically, pharmacotherapy is, is you're going to be your best friend. So um, I, with that, I would just conclude that weight gain is common. 
um, and should education preoperatively and regular follow-up, weekly weigh-ins, encourage the support groups, adequate protein, regular exercise. And the most important thing is don't be judgmental. And you guys aren't. I mean, you guys, I'm talking to the choir, but, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're just not following what we tell you to do. And there's a lot of other factors on that. So I just want to close by thanking um, Carlos and Nelson and everybody. It's been a true honor and a pleasure to be here this past few days, and I really enjoyed talking with a lot of you. So thank you very much for the invitation to come here. Thank you. Thank you.